Consider this, a trip to the grocery store turns violent. You see a crowd gathered in the parking lot and you hear people screaming and shouting. A uniformed police officer is taking blows to the head and the criminal is trying to get at his holstered gun. Should you shoot the attacker? In this video, I'm gonna break down the scenario and your options and give you a few reminders of what you must consider if you wanna get involved in a situation like this. But first, let me remind you we have a gun giveaway going on right now. You can enter for free and it ends really soon. Just click on the link in the description below to reveal which brand new gun you can win. Hi, I'm Kevin Michalowski, Director of Content for the U.S. Concealed Carry Association. If you're new to this channel, we help responsibly armed Americans like you get educated, trained, and insured. Now, let's talk about this scenario. It's just another day in your busy life when you realize you need to head to the nearby big box store for some badly needed supplies. After a short internal debate, you decide that even though it's a short trip, you're going to take your pistol. It's a good choice. I recommend it all the time. The parking lot is packed with cars and pedestrians headed in every direction. You locate a suitable parking spot not too far from the door and you make your way inside. As you approach the door, you notice a shabby looking guy just sitting there right in the entrance, rocking back and forth and muttering. You give him a wide berth and you continue on your mission. After about 15 minutes, because you are a type A shopper, you have checked out and headed toward the door. But now you see a crowd gathered and you hear people screaming and shouting. Some are hollering, get off him, get off him. At least one man is screaming, beat his ass, and a third man is muttering something about police brutality. There is a marked police cruiser nearby, and you try to walk past minding your own business. The crowd parts just enough for you to see an incredibly violent struggle taking place in the center of the crowd. You stop for a better look and realize something is very serious going on here. The scent of OC spray is in the air, and you see coiled wires from taser probes being dragged around, and the fight continues. Spectators are sensing that things are getting really dangerous and they begin to back away as the officer struggles to get this subject under control. You recognize the man as the same guy who was sitting on the ground muttering when you walked in. Now with a twisting motion, the man fighting with the officer is able to break one hand free and deliver a crushing blow to this officer's face. The attacker clearly now has the upper hand and the officer begins to fall forward from the debilitating blow to her head and the attacker reaches for her belt and begins tugging at something. You see this criminal is pulling on the officer's holster as she struggles to keep control of her gun. But the attacker sees another weapon and grabs the cop's expandable baton. He flicks it open and begins beating the officer on the back and upside her already bloody head. She's trying to shield herself from the blows and she's clearly stunned and unable to fight. So what are your options? You can reach for your phone and call 911 to report that an officer is in trouble. You can charge forward and tackle the man who's swinging the baton. You can draw your pistol and order the man to stop the assault, or you can draw your pistol and fire immediately. But there are some things to consider. You have watched this fight unfold and know clearly what is happening. You don't know why they are fighting, and it really doesn't matter at this point, but the officer has, for all intents and purposes, lost the fight, and the attacker is not running away, but is rather pressing the attack. The injuries to the officer already appear serious and her ability to defend herself is greatly reduced. So if you decide to be a good witness, calling 911 at this point is a double-edged sword. Doing so might not bring help to the officer in time to save her. She's likely already radioed for backup, but you can't know this for certain and you don't know how far away that help is. If you make the call, you have tied up at least one of your hands should you decide to intervene in this fight. You're also using valuable time time that this officer may not have, to explain to the dispatcher what's happening and where you are. And again, the dispatcher may have this information from other callers. If you jump into the fight, the attacker is armed with a baton. Some people say only a baton, but if you've ever been struck with one, you will never say only a baton. A full on bull rush and flying tackle will likely put the attacker on the ground but now you are wrapped up with someone willing and able to actively and effectively fight with a cop. So what does that mean this person is gonna do with you? There are myriad other things to think about before deciding to engage in such a fight. Not only could this person armed with a baton overpower you and begin assaulting you, but what are you rushing into? Is this person carrying contaminated needles for drug use? Is this person infected with any sort of communicable disease such as hepatitis or HIV? Could there be transfer of bloodborne pathogens during a violent struggle on the ground? What will you do if you get control of this person during the fight? 
You don't have any means of restraining a violent person. So that means you are stuck holding on for dear life until help arrives. And what about that help that might be on the way? Police officers responding to this call or any call of an officer in trouble are coming in hot. When they get there and they see you rolling around on the ground near an injured officer, you can bet that the initial treatment is going to be pretty rough, at least until they figure out what's going on. By then, you will already be in handcuffs face down on the ground. So you have the option of drawing your gun and giving some commands. Yes, giving a clear verbal challenge is typically a good option. It proves to investigators you gave the attacker a chance to stop and comply before you started shooting to stop that threat. But giving such commands takes time. During the time you start yelling, the attacker could hit the officer at least once more. While you wait to see if there is a response, there could be another strike. Once you realize the attacker doesn't care what you're saying, that officer could have absorbed at least three or four more blows before you take action. So now we're down to drawing your gun and immediately firing. Based on what you have seen and what you know of the law, the attacker is clearly presenting an imminent deadly threat. You very likely have the legal right to fire, even without offering that verbal challenge. But you have some very important things to consider. As you reach for your gun and look for that front sight, do you remember the three factors needed to take a shot? Target acquisition, check. You see clearly the target in front of you. Target identification, check. This is a target that is clearly presenting an imminent deadly threat, and you know this for certain. Target isolation, hold your fire. If you shoot at this person, is this the only person you will hit with your rounds? In this sort of setting, you must have good target isolation to make sure your shots don't hit any bystanders. Can you get a clean shot off and not hit the officer? Is there anyone in the background? Is there anyone moving in from the sides to help the cop? Can you change your elevation to get a safer shot? What if you kneel down and shoot at a more upward angle? You certainly won't hit the cop on the ground, and if you miss, your shots will likely go over the heads of the bystanders. But those projectiles will come down somewhere, so don't miss. Consider moving closer to the target to get a better shot. But now what? On top of all of this, you need to consider your actions after this incident, especially if you decide to shoot. The police are coming, you know that. If the officer wasn't able to call for backup, someone in the crowd very likely did. And you can bet that once you start shooting, someone is going to call the cops. And you need to be ready for their response. You also need to be ready for the response from the crowd. After any shooting, you need to move to a position of tactical advantage. You need to be safe. Don't just stand there. You may want to move to an area where your back is protected. You never know if the person you just shot has a friend who might lash out at you. Or there might be an anti-cop social justice warrior standing in the crowd shooting cell phone video waiting for a chance to lash out at you. And remember the police will arrive. When they do, put your gun down and follow their orders to the letter. Move slowly. Ask for clarification if police officers say anything you don't understand and keep your hands up, open, and still. This is a big decision wading into a fight that you otherwise have no part in and it always requires forethought and clear-headed decision-making. But you don't always have lots of time to think and make those decisions. You need to think about this stuff well before you are presented with such a situation. There is no single bright line defining exactly what you should do. The details of every situation are different, and every situation is dynamic. This decision is up to you. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of this video. And I'll remind you again, we have that gun giveaway going on and it ends soon. All you need to do is click the link below and reveal which brand new gun you could win. I'm Kevin Michalowski, Director of Content for the U.S. Concealed Carry Association. If you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe, comment, and share this video because YouTube is actively suppressing firearms videos and we need your help to defeat the algorithm and push gun videos out to more people. Stay safe and we'll see you in the next video.